Oh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session on the big leap, picking the right Drupal journey towards Drupal 10. So, yeah, this is about me, and I'm I'm Kalit Chilvan, and uh, I have a total of uh, 13 years of experience with PHP, uh, Zen Frame. I started with core PHP, Zen Framework, and then moved out to Drupal. Uh, and uh, also, I would, uh, I've been in web development since then. I play the role of a Drupal staff engineer at Axelorin. Uh, I, I am a Drupal certified Drupal expert, and I, I have led large teams of uh, size uh, 15 up to large. And I also like to travel and explore new places. And uh, you can reach me at these channels in LinkedIn or Twitter or uh, at my Drupal ID. So, yeah, I, I work for Accelerant. Uh, it's been three years I've been working with Accelerant and we are an integrated global delivery partner for agencies and customers that puts care into employee happiness, engineering excellence and customer success. So jumping right into the topic. Uh, so we, we, we now know that uh, Drupal 7 end of life which will not be extended anymore uh, is, is January 5th, 2025. And the migration is uh, very much need of the R. Uh, so, so other than, uh, other than uh, just uh, to make the, have the site uh, to be covered under security, uh, what are the other reasons to migrate to Drupal 10? Uh, first thing is Drupal 7 end of life is also nearing by end of this year. And uh, there are things like uh, better performance uh, uh, via Big Pipe uh, and uh, omni-channel support via RESTful services, better editorial experience with CK Editor 5 and also Gutenberg being kind of sponsored now um, and the flexibility in managing any entity. Uh, as in Drupal 7, you cannot uh, really uh, make any entity any entity fieldable, whereas in Drupal 8 plus you can do that and automatic updates almost in core and uh, also accessibility with Olivero and Claro. Uh, we have a lot uh, more support for accessibility uh, in Drupal 8 plus and 9 and 10. So, and I, I think uh, the the reasons here are pretty obvious, but uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy call for anyone on Drupal 7 to do this large migration. Uh, but uh, but it's, it, it, it would be encouraging to look at uh, what are the benefits that we are getting and uh, uh, look at this as a complete chance to digitalize the entire uh, site and the experience for the end users uh, in a more modern way. Uh, uh, if we look at that from that perspective, rather than looking at it for just as a Drupal 7 to uh, 10 migration it would be uh, more uh, uh, more there are good chances of doing much more than just doing a migration and uh, we will see how that is possible uh, in in the forthcoming slides so what are the various aspects i would like to start with a question from the audience like uh, what are the aspects you would want to consider when moving from drupal 7 to drupal 9 plus so or drupal 10 or anything so uh, what comes to your mind immediately apart from the custom modules. Anything? If, if people want to come up to the oh, mic. Sure. To... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving, moving from like a file field to the media library mm -hmm. is something I would. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah, that's that's that we will talk about that. We, I have a slide for that as well, so yeah. And and uh, we obviously would think of these things, right? Uh, and uh, we would think of content type, taxonomy, modules, and uh, how we can bring the roles and content workflow to work together. Uh, how are we going to manage the media, like you said? Uh, and also, this reengineering is is kind of something that uh, that I discovered as a chance to do it. Uh, because since anyway, we are going to change a lot of things uh, at the end of the migration. So why not do, do a lot of changes that will benefit us in the long run as well? And what are the general aspects we need to consider as well? And and yeah, the finally, the documentation part, which uh, which is kind of underrated, but, but still it's very important uh, how we document all these uh, changes because uh, we are we are mostly going to 
decide a lot of things at this at the end of this planning and process but it's important that we document all these things for the end, for the implementation team on when they would when they actually do all these things so starting with the content types uh, it's it's important that we start with a clean slate uh, forget about the challenges that we had in drupal 7 and uh, whatever was possible or was not possible uh, let's let's uh, uh, keep that aside for a minute and just think uh, as if we are new to drupal and uh, and what what would we like to do for the end users what, be very ambitious uh, it's okay uh, because we are, that's that's when we try to do uh, great things uh, so let's look at the open minded like uh, what are the uh, various uh, content type changes that we can do and it starts with meaningful questions uh, uh, like uh, like for example what whether all the fields in the content type are used and whether we really need the content type uh, in in drupal 10 and also what is the retention policy of the data like do we want to migrate all the data or or some uh, like we want to retain some data like we just want to migrate uh, one year of data or something like that so uh, it's it's good to discuss about these things as well so that uh, we we don't make the new site as ab as the existing site and it 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 uh, it, it it is more future looking and it has a lot of space to fill in uh, new content rather than having all the content from the existing site and uh, and which which might not even be looked at and that's not really good for seo as well uh, so uh, we categorize the content types into two two categories here uh, one being the content types that solely rely on the body field where most of the content are stored on the body field and content types that need rich field sets like different types of fields and uh, um, and the body field is usually like very small and it just contains one or two paragraphs and we also merged a lot of content types in this process because uh, when when we considered uh, the content types that solely rely on the body field what we did was we add a mapping field in the new site that would map to the old content types in the existing site and migrated all those content types into one content type like into the basic page content type for example and we added a field that maps to the uh, old content types in Drupal 7. So this helped us to reduce the number of content types because we do really don't need any different information architecture when all the content types are just having the body field, right? So uh, that's why we use the basic page and just added an additional field to know for the editors and for uh, everyone that these are the old content types in Drupal 7. So we used the taxonomy for that and we just added an additional field in the basic page. And uh, this this table uh, was the format that we used. It very 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 much helped us in the content type discovery. Like we wrote down for every content type whether we want to first migrate it to Drupal nine. Is it really used? Are the editors adding and updating content? And is it shown as end user pages or not? Or is it just uh, uh, kind of pages that is somewhere in the database, but it's really not. Uh, and driven as a user workflow from the menus or from the website so that is also something and uh, and we considered during this process so we also checked what roles use this content uh, let's say that we are thinking about dropping some content types then in that case if there are certain roles that use these content types then do we have to migrate those roles as well or can we drop those roles and who are the users who are assigned those roles and in that case, are they active users? Do we need to drop them as well? So these are the different questions that we asked and we evaluated during the migration process. And uh, and for example, we, we we might have multiple levels of pages. This was the case in the site that we worked. And uh, we really don't, we realized that we don't really need that many levels or people are not even going to that many levels. And uh, it, it is not uh, good for SEO as well because it your site becomes really like uh, like a really uh, multiple levels of rabbit hole so we don't want to go there and we want to stick on to just one or two levels and uh, categorize the information in a much better way so that is that is all about content types uh, so this was the kind of discovery that we did for content types and the next next thing that we did was uh, for modules and taxonomy related uh, discoveries so here what we did was like you can see on the right we created a table and we listed the modules the sub modules uh, which are sub modules in the sense just to know 
for more detailed information on the description uh, if if we want to add any description uh, specific to us where we are using in the site and things like that and the, the type and also any entity related configuration for example just to have the configuration pages handy for each of those modules so that we don't have to go to the extend page or go to the config uh, and search for the configuration page and also uh, whether uh, this this was done as a drupal 7 to 9 migration so we checked whether uh, uh, the drupal 9 is available or not and uh, and uh, there were three decisions that we three, one of the three decisions that we made starting with whether we want to remove this module or whether we want to replace the module or whether we want to upgrade the module. So obviously we might remove some modules which are already included in core uh, and uh, which included some contributed modules as well, which were added as utility modules. So these modules were categorized as uh, must and should have, uh, like in the last column, like uh, for modules which are in core and contributed modules, which are very highly used in Drupal 7, were categorized as must and should have modules. Whereas modules which uh, which uh, which uh, which were not actively used, uh, kind of utility contributed modules which were added, uh, but uh, they uh, they tend to be not uh, very good that much used now, right? So those modules we did not really add in Drupal uh, nine because the reason being that uh, if we need uh, see a need, then uh, we can add it of course anytime. So we kind of reduce the contributed module weightage, so that that actually reduces the time needed to spin up the site in your uh, continuous integration pipelines and things like that. So your site becomes really lightweight and that's the advantage you get when you reduce the number of modules in your site as well. And uh, and uh, yeah, so we also revisited the taxonomy. We created a lot of new taxonomy. We changed the fields in the taxonomy, existing taxonomy. We renamed a lot of taxonomy because they were not actually portraying what they wanted to portray. So these are the kind of changes we did and we use this sheet on the right uh, so that uh, we document uh, all the modules and it is very similar to the sheet that we get uh, in Drupal uh, community to upgrade the modules. So uh, we, we, we followed that and we just added the must, must for rules of prioritization at the end of the column as the last column. So uh, this, this is how we uh, do the cleanup but also decided what modules we want and what modules we didn't do not want. So yeah, this is another area where we tend to overlook mostly, but it 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 uh, it becomes a really uh, pain when we see the permissions page being a very wide page with a lot of roles, and uh, it was really very difficult to scroll the page even for the editors uh, in Drupal Seven. And that's when we thought like, why not we evaluate the roles and the permissions as well. And uh, the common issues that we faced was, uh, there were too many roles and the duplicate permissions were available. And uh, we will see in the next slide as well about this. And uh, and uh, delete permissions were given to non-admin users and the certain pages were even deleted. And uh, content workflow was not that much streamlined. There was possibility of pages being published without being reviewed and also renaming of roles were needed for better clarity. So, and we, so we followed these principles of having minimal access, uh, which means that we did not give uh, uh, delete access unless uh, it's really needed. And we add the delete access for content only for admin administrator role. And uh, we, we also minimize the number of roles. Uh, we will see how we achieve that in the next slide. We did a lot of user cleanup uh, we we make sure that uh, the users who are active are only moved to the new site and the users who are not active or blocked are not moved. And also, uh, we, we it's also important we decide between manual role mapping or uh, uh, migration scripts because uh, if the number of users you are finally deciding to move to the new site is very less, it's better to do a manual role mapping because you might end up changing a lot of roles and as a result, um, you might want to do the manual role mapping. But if if the roles are very good in the existing Drupal 7 site, you are not going to do any changes. And also you are going to migrate most of the users, then it's okay to write migration scripts. But we need to be mindful that these migration scripts are going to be used one time only, mostly, right? And so is it really, uh, uh, I mean, is it really worth to spend all that effort to write those migration scripts is a question that we want to ask ourselves. 
but uh, we did a manual role mapping in our case because uh, a lot changed in roles and users as well and the number of users drastically reduced in the near side and this this is good from a security point of view as well so this is an example of how we reduce the number of roles and uh, we structure the roles uh, based on the content restriction which content types they want to access and also what kind of actions they want to do on the content type so for example let's say that we had a role a role b like this different kind of roles which is the existing site and we add a role a for create and edit content type a and we then created a role b for creating and editing content type b plus also publishing it uh, and we also created role c for uh, updating both the content types so you get the picture right and we create we kept on creating roles as we deemed necessary as we thought that more uh, uh, different kind of permissions are needed but what this resulted is that this resulted in a lot of roles being redundant as well so what we did as an alternative in the new site is we created the roles based on the content type so the year the end result would be you will have number of roles equivalent to the number of content types but since you are also looking at reducing the content types this there are good chances both will reduce here in the new site the content type and the roles as well. so you will have a one on one mapping between the roles and the content types here and you will also have a role that uh, as publish permissions which is very general for all content types and what we do here is that we for any new user we give them a combination of which content type they want to use and also whether they want publish permissions or not if we don't give role c they will not have publish permission they will just have create and edit permission for those content types and if we give role c then they will also have publish permission along with the editing permissions so this is how we reduce the number of roles in the new site and uh, it it also simplified a lot of things uh, for the administrator particularly to see what are the roles and uh, even if you want to add a new role it it made more sense because to add based on the content type and uh, it also gives a minimal access as well so yeah any questions so far we have a separate slide for questions so we we, we will discuss more on that but if if there's anything i can answer Uh, so we will proceed further with uh, what what do we do to choose a new mod choosing the right module uh, it is very important that we choose the right modules here uh, because uh, the needs might change as we migrate to the new uh, platform uh, so we used permissions by term here and uh, permissions by term uh, you help us to uh, actually uh, give permissions based on the term the campaign belongs to right and we did not use the group module in the site but uh, we considered it because it gave a more decentralized control of the site rather than being with uh, uh, just with the user one or the administrator uh, but this is something that you really want to evaluate whether you want to decentralize the control or not because uh, that might have its own repercussions as well so uh, if if you have many sub administrators for different departments who are accountable for different content then it makes sense to have the group module but otherwise it's okay if you are not using it uh, so and uh, also uh, sites which need a simple workflow you can use the content moderation in core uh, and provided that you are not using any specific module in drupal 7 but if you are using workflow in drupal 7 or uh, uh, any uh, then it's okay to use the same workflow in drupal 10 as well um and uh, also if you want a uh, dashboard kind of a thing and if you want to trigger email notifications whenever content is updated or content is created then then you you want to use the workbench suite which consists of workbench workbench moderation and workbench email we use this this was the option that we chose and uh, uh, trash bin is all now available uh, it was not available by the time we did this but uh, Uh, now it's available and uh, we also have workflow buttons uh, module which provides us with the trash bin feature uh, so we at that time we just used the archiving feature uh, but now trash bin is available so yeah proceeding further to the media so uh, so we have uh, we again we started asking questions before looking at the options we have 
Uh, so first, one of the questions that we asked is, uh, does the current Drupal 7 site contain media, which is mostly images, or is it really a media rich site? Like, does it have videos, audio scripts, and different types of files? And as as we as you said rightly, it's it's a different field, five field types in Drupal seven, right? So that's the question as well. Do we need to need the same field to store different types of media? Then we can merge a lot of fields in Drupal nine plus. And uh, what is the future scope of media as well? So uh, is it very metadata rich? Uh, do we want to show a lot of metadata that is related to media? Then then it's better to use the media module uh, as the core. So we have to decide between multiple options here. One is the same approach as in Drupal 7, which is very rare, unless the media is, uh, there's no much changes in media or the media is already very much organized in Drupal 7, then you can go with the same approach. And all, or you can deliverage the media module completely and depend on the media module, uh, which is in core as well. So you don't have to worry about much about the support. And also, or you can also create custom media types, like any custom entity type. So, uh, so, and also create your own metadata, right? So yeah, these are the options that we have. So it's important that we are mindful and pick up these options. And uh, so we don't just migrate everything uh, and, but we really reevaluate how media is, what is the future scope of media and how we want to change it now as well. And these are the, some of the modules that we came across when using the media starting with uh, uh, file entity browser, which is a uh, files, not a media uh, site. It's a file file uh, field kind of a supportive module, which allows you to uh, browse file fields uh, and uh, which is which can be a simple image or video or file field part. And uh, media directory supports the media ecosystem. Uh, and and it, it, it allows you to upload uh, files into specific directories. They are virtual directories. They are not actual physical directories in the Drupal file system, but they are virtual directories. But there is work is in progress in order to move and make it into an actual physical directory. And now the media library also supports drag and drop, uh, and uh, and it is also available for for media. So you uh, just to conclude here, you have two two routes you can take. You can go by the file field. Uh, field types, or you can go by the media field types. So whatever you want to do. So, uh, but 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 it's better that you go by the media path if you want to store different types of uh, uh, media in the same field, so that it allows you to do. Yeah, coming to the reengineering part, and uh, um, so so what what is reengineering is that uh, we we kind of reevaluated the fields as well. Uh, and uh, we checked whether uh, uh, what kind of data types are used to store the fields because uh, this this started with the with the pain when we looked at the content edit screen like or a content ad screen when in Drupal seven when the entire screen was looking like a infinitely scrollable screen with a lot of uh, fields just having a large seek editor field to just have two words in it or things like that. So those were the reasons which motivated us to look at this. And what we did was we evaluated every field and the data type that is used. Uh, uh, the ex some examples of how we use it was plain text uh, instead of having a date field or CK editor instead of having a plain text and, uh, and list text instead of having a taxonomy. So it is good to move to the actual field types uh, that is intended uh, to be used uh, as for the field API. Uh, and uh, for in the new Drupal 9 or 10 site. So if they are compatible with the existing data, so that is obviously something we want to check, right? So if they are not compatible, then during the migration, we might have to do some pre-processing so that it is compatible. So there are two ways to handle this. One is either you can do this option that you do some pre-processing and migrate, which kind of increases the migration time. Uh, but the other option is having a new field in the new site and not just migrating the old data into the existing field type, but uh, slowly moving on to the new field and encouraging the editors to use the new field in the, uh, for the new content. And you can do the migration post the actual content migration as well, uh, once you have landed on the Drupal 10 site. So if you want to do that, just to make sure that uh, everything is, uh, that you want to reduce the time to migrate, but at the same time you want to do this, then you can you utilize that option.
The benefit here is that, as I told, it's a much more improved editorial experience. The editors can easily update whatever they update. They don't have to uh, scroll infinitely or look at wider screens uh, or large spaces. And it is more optimized DB storage, of course, from a technical point of view as well. And it is better user experience for editors, finally. So what are the other aspects that we had to consider when we did the migration is that what are the integrations that are available and any field name changes that we need to do in the content types like I told earlier and any new fields that need to be added for better representation of content. Uh, for example, there might be some fields that, that might to be split into two fields or something like that. So any field settings that need to be changed like default value of the field or maybe it might uh, be in a required field unnecessarily in Drupal 7 and we want to remove it or something like that. So what, and also we considered what are the pre-processing like we discussed that need to be done during the migration so that uh, uh, it, the new field type is compatible with the data as well uh, um, and the, the data fits well in the field type. And it's, it, this is just one use case. We, there might be more pre-processing opportunities and need also. So based on that, we can decide what to do. Yeah, and finally, the final step is documenting whatever we have decided so far. So in all these things, we decided a lot of things. We want to change this, we want to use this module, and uh, we want to remove these modules. We want to change the content workflow, or we want to change the media and how we handle the media and things like that. This is a lot of change from uh, for all the stakeholders, uh, um, even sometimes for the end user, because. At the end of this migration, we also redesigned the entire site uh, in the front end. So it is also a good chance to do this because uh, at the end of the day, you are going to give a different digital experience, a modern digital experience in the new platform. So why not redesign the front end as well? And uh, that, that, that gave a new look and it was all possible because we considered that during the migration. And what to document is literally every decision that you made because the teams that might implement this might change. Uh, they might come and they might uh, they might even ask why these people did what they did. So why why is this change or why is this field removed while it's there in the old site, right? So these kind of questions are very natural and we we definitely don't want them to come back to us or search for us to get their answers. And, uh, and this is like adding a comment in code. So we are just documenting whatever decision we made. And this was a document that uh, uh, I created as part of it. And uh, so here, as you can see, we wrote for every content type, we gave a brief description of what the content type does, because if the team doing the migration is not the same team as handle the existing site, then they also need to know about the content type, right? and uh, what are the field requirements or what are the different fields that are in Drupal 7 and how they are mapped to the Drupal 9 fields. And what is the content retention policy for this particular content type that we want to follow? What are the aggregation pages that this content type is shown? And, uh, and how do we want to sort it? Uh, what are the filtration mechanisms we want to have in these aggregate pages and things like that? And we also add a link to the design, uh, how the page would look in the full view. And what are the different migration considerations that we want to consider here? And what assumptions we have based on which we have taken a lot of decisions? And finally, any references that we want to do. So this kind of document we created for every content type and not just for content types, for every topic that we discussed in this uh, session. So that, that helped us everyone to go back and check and see uh, what decisions we made, why we made, and, and how, how it is needed for that particular uh, website right so yeah i think that's that's all uh that we uh, that we considered and it's a lot <laughs> uh but uh but sorry if i have rushed uh but yeah i'm open for questions okay thanks yeah if people have questions they can just come up to the mic here and ask hey one question um for someone who's familiar with, say, a seven to eight migration, how does migrating seven to nine or seven to 10 change? Have there been any new things added in nine or 10 that have either made that more difficult or more uh, things that would be different than migrating to eight from seven? Uh, 
I I I don't uh, personally I I don't think migrating to Rupal nine would be more difficult than Rupal eight because uh, uh, because uh, it's almost the same actually. Uh, Drupal nine just contains a lot of uh, deprecation code that have been removed with the latest PHP version. Uh, so you might have to consider one thing, which is uh, how much deprecated code uh, which runs on older PHP versions are there in your Drupal seven side. So that was the one additional effort that might be needed with migrating to Drupal nine plus. But uh, but really migrating to Drupal eight, I don't think is any more an option. But you can migrate to Drupal nine. Uh, and uh, you and fixing this deprecated code is not a large uh, amount of effort because there are uh, go, good automated ways like Rector to fix these deprecated codes, and uh, also there is good amount of support as well for everything. And uh, and most of the time, migrating to Drupal nine, uh, if if you have really used best code, good coding practices, then it mostly involves uh, just changing the info file, just one file in the entire module. So it is not a large effort. Uh, the short answer is it's not much different. So, and that's why we recommend to migrate to Drupal 9 or Drupal 10, actually. We are my recommending now to migrate to Drupal 10, actually, because Drupal 9 end of life is also nearing. And uh, when all the sites that we are migrating from PHP 7.4 to PHP 8, we are also parallelly do along with that, we are doing the Drupal 10 migration as well. Because it's, it's anyway is it's going to expire Drupal 9's uh, life, and so we are doing both, and we are migrating to Drupal 10. So it's it's overall gives a good experience for all the stakeholders uh, with Claro and Olivero in Drupal 10 uh, and Drupal 9 plus uh, later versions. But uh, uh, but it's it's okay. It's 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 not a large amount of effort between eight or nine or ten. All right, thanks. Any other yeah. questions? Okay. Well, thanks for the presentation and um, yeah, we'll get this up thank on you. the website. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.